Good evening, good evening, family, and welcome to Impact Citadel Love and Relationship Month. God bless you for joining. I think this is the first time I'm seeing everybody in this month of February. God bless you. Please make sure you share the link tonight. This month, we have declared Love and Relationship Month at Impact Citadel. Um, in the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about different things as it pertains to relationships. Who remembers what we talked about uh, last week and the week before? I want you to type it in the chat. If you remember what we talked about last week and the week before, amen go ahead and share with us in the chat. We talked about relationship intelligence, right? Uh, Mr. Larry said we talked about toxic relationships. We even had uh, a speaker that joined us last week. How many of you remember who she was and what she talked about? Amen. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to be talking about love. Amen. Yes. Relationship intelligence. Make sure you share the link. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, love. We're going to be talking about love. We're going to be talking about uh, sex for married couples. We're going to be talking about dating as well. We're going to be talking about marriage, right? Uh, someone said in the chat, she talked about how to overcome toxic relationships. So I want you to do me a favor, make sure you share this video, at least with your loved one, at least if you're dating, share it with your, your, your fiance, your fiance, your, uh, whoever that person is right. Uh, so that we can learn, uh, let's open up with a prayer and ask the Holy spirit to, uh, lead us tonight. Uh, and edify our conversation. Spirit of the living God, we thank you. We welcome you into our midst this evening. I pray that as we speak and as we talk, Lord, I pray that your wisdom uh, would fill us. I pray that you will give us wisdom through your word. I pray that you will give us insights. I pray that you will give us uh, Lord, hope even for uh, people that may feel a little hopeless concerning their love and their relationship life. I pray you will give us wisdom. I pray that your truth will be imprinted on our hearts. I pray that we will live edified. I pray our relationships will thrive. Our relationships will be healthy. I pray, oh God, that you reveal yourself to us in this meeting and you will calm every heart and speak to us so powerfully. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So make sure you share the link this evening. Make sure you share the link. We're going to be talking about the seven types of love or the seven dimensions of love. Someone type the seven dimensions of love, the seven dimensions of love, right? When you think of the word love, what do you, what comes to mind, right? Let's put some thoughts in the chat. What do we think about when we think of the word love? What, what comes to mind? What, what do we think about? What, what rings a bell to us when we talk about love? When we talk about, when you hear that word love, what comes to mind, right? What comes to mind when you think of just the word love? What, what thoughts come to mind? What, what sort of emotions does it evoke? right? What do you, what, what, what comes to your thought process? What do you think about? What does it, what, what, what comes to you, right? I think the word love sometimes has been used very loosely, right? Uh, sometimes when people think about the word love, the first thing they think about is um, getting intimate with somebody, right? And definitely there is that aspect uh, as well, right? Uh, but Love is not just about getting intimate with somebody physically, right? Um, sorry, I'm just now seeing the chat. Someone said affection, decision, connection, value, emotion, right? Sometimes you say, oh, I love this dress, right? Uh, or I love this guy. I love this family. Or I love this teacher. I love this church. Uh, or I don't like this church. Or, or maybe not love. I like, 
right? Uh, so love evokes very strong emotions, right? Um, just uh, someone said obedience, right? Uh, which makes sense, right? Uh, Jesus asked one of the disciples, he said, do you love me? Uh, and the disciple said, yes, I love you. He said, okay, if you love me, then obey my commandment, right? Uh, uh, he didn't say, if you love me, then kiss me or touch me or have sex with me, right? I say that to say that that means they are different kinds of love, if we're even permitted to say such a thing, right? There's different kinds of love because when Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, keep my commandment, right? That wasn't the kind of love where he was demanding uh, sex as an exchange for the demonstration of their love, right? Sometimes you say, I, I, I love um, my pastor, right? Does that mean that you're, you're going to get the pastor to come and live with you? No. Right. Or you say, I love, I love the lady that leads, uh, this ministry, or I love, uh, the lady that leads the choir. Right. Uh, there might be a reason why you love her, right. There may be a reason why you're using that word. So one of the things we're going to be talking about tonight is the seven types of love. Someone type that's the seven types of love or the seven dimensions of love. Um, I think it was today I was going through some of my box, my boxes from school. I, ha I have some old stuff in some of my boxes, like textbook and just receipts, just old stuff from, you know, mm -hmm. some time back. And um, I saw a CD. I mean, people don't really play use CDs anymore. And I was listening to a teaching about 15 years ago at a church, and it was a seminar. And I was a college student and I was like, well, I'm a college student. I mean, what does this matter? This is, I don't, I don't really understand why I have to be sitting here li listening to love and sex and marriage. What do I care? You know, I just want to go to school and get money to pay my tuition and graduate. Right. But it's important for us to hear these things. Right. Because uh, for many reasons, some of you are married, some of you are in relationships, some of you are desiring marriage. Some of you are, um, uh, single mothers, uh, some of your single fathers, some of you are going through maybe a challenging time in life or in relationship. It could be so many things. So the message really spans so many things. Welcome all of you that are joining. God bless you. Make sure you share the link so you can bless someone this evening, right? So seven dimensions of love, right? So I remember I was sitting in the meeting and I was like, I don't even have anybody that loves me. <laughs> I don't have a lover. I don't have a boyfriend. I don't have anybody that's going to give me a gift. So why am I in this sermon? I don't, I don't understand why the church is talking about this. I was so upset. I told the pastor, I said, anytime they do this love stuff, I don't want to be here because I don't have anybody that loves me. So I don't want to be at this meeting, right? Has anybody felt that way before, right? At some point in life, you were in church or you were somewhere or some seminar, especially around this time, you know, someone was telling me today, why is everybody posting about love? All the social media handles are love, love, love. Why? Why? You know, and the person says, this is so frustrating, right? And I said, why is it frustrating? And she said, it's too much because some of us are not married. You see, but today's session about the seven dimensions of love is not just for people that are married. So if you're tuning in, I don't want you to think, oh, this is for the marriage stuff, the married people, they're going to be telling us stuff, and then they're going to make the rest of us look a certain way. No. As a matter of stuff, uh, matter of fact, I think that if we hear some of these conversations, we can have a healthy understanding of love. And if we desire to be in a marriage, because not everybody wants to be in a marriage, contrary to popular belief, right? There are people in the Bible that never married, right? And they were perfectly fine. But there are people that desire to be in a marriage relationship, right? There are people who are not in a marriage relationship because something happened to their spouse, right? It doesn't mean something is wrong with them. So when we talk about the seven dimensions of love, it's not something that's just for DOV because she's married. No, it's not just for me because I'm married. No, it's not just for somebody who has a fiance or, or, or fiance, right? Larry, that's true, right? It, it's, it's all encompassing. In fact, I think because we don't have a healthy understanding of love, the moment we mention the word love, everybody thinks about, or not everybody, but most people think about, oh, does it mean you're going to kiss me? Does it mean you're going to touch me? Does it mean you're going to give me money? If you love me, give me money, right? People have limited love to mean give me money. 
feed my 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 bad behaviors right feed my my negative tantrums and whatnot right the first thing i want us to talk about someone type the seven types of love or the seven dimensions of love the seven dimensions of love the seven dimensions of love right have you ever thought about the different ramifications of love right the first one i want to talk about today the first one i want to talk about today is eros e r o s someone say eros right eros and these are these things were coined from uh uh um uh uh from the greek language right and eros is the root word for erotic what does erotic mean eros is a type of romantic love right it's it's an intense sexual desire for someone don't get quiet on me because i know we've all at some point felt a very strong <laughs> sexual desire for somebody right it, it's a romantic passionate love and it involves the body so it's a physical love so i'm not talking about cuz i heard somebody say this which is weird it was a married couple and she said i love my husband but i don't demonstrate it with my body it's just in my mind it's just in my mind i have erotic love for him but i don't want to touch him and i don't want him to touch me but eros is an intense romantic love that involves the body and you know when the person said it i made a joke and i said girl you know we were burning with passion when we were single this is i mean come on you're married now you know <laughs> what do you mean you you're not going to let him touch you i mean she said i'm not even making this up she said it's in my mind it's not really oh wow peter gaia says many couples have that issue that's good to know and i think pastor pastor told me that this evening and I, and he said he was going to talk about it when we talk about marriage so maybe that will come up so she told me and i said so how do you guys show affection and she said and we'll talk about affection how people show affection and she said we we just we we just know we love each other it's like a telepathy thing where you know he sits here i sit here and then we kind of connect intellectually and that was my first time hearing that and i found it very inter interesting you know <laughs> uh someone said in the chat a lot of people have misinterpreted that in marriage especially especially christians and the reason why i'm talking about it very very great point there is because eros is erotic it involves the body and there is no shame when it comes to that as a matter of fact god told adam and eve to procreate to to dominate and you are not going to have be able to do that without a form of erotic love even even when it comes to the medical way you know in vitro fertilization i want to believe that there's still some erotic passions that are aroused you know because the the way the body is the god designed the human body you know there's there is erotic love that inspire some of these things you know god created the human being as such a beautiful sophisticated system so god talks about the marriage bed not being defiled god said the man and the woman were together and they were naked and they were not ashamed in the book of uh, uh, genesis right larry will post the scripture right that nakedness wasn't just physical it was also they were naked with each other they were naked with their emotions but there was a physical aspect so it's great if you can if you're one of those people that can intellectually be romantic with your spouse i mean a part of me was even thinking of masturbation when she said that i said what do you mean it's in your brain so when you feel it what do you do to your body because your body will have a response unless you don't feel anything and then she said my body don't feel anything it's just my mind and that's something that if you're dealing with in a marriage relationship we need to investigate because erotic love is referred to in the bible right if you open to the book of uh songs of solomon uh songs of solomon i believe chapters uh let me see here in my notes i think i put that scripture down songs of solomon um there's a part of the bible that talks about uh uh uh, uh solomon describes that sexual experience between himself uh, uh or, or between a uh, a spouse between two uh, uh people in a marriage relationship he talks about erotic love he describes uh, uh an intense 
uh, sexual romantic love, right? Um, let me see if I can find that scripture. Uh, very, very passionate love, right? Um, Songs of Solomon chapters 2 verse 1. It says, my beloved spoke and said to me, arise my darling, my beautiful one, come inside of me. See, the winter is past, the rains are gone over. Uh, the flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard. The fig tree forms its early fruit. He was using all these metaphors. He said, arise my darling, my darling and come to me. My dove in the cleft of the rocks. Those were metaphorical expressions relating to sexual intimacy. Right? He said, show me your face uh, uh, and let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Right? In fact, when you read that whole book of Songs of Solomon, there's a lot of reference to sexual, uh, 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 even almost biblical foreplay in a way. Right? It's, it's a poem about extravagant lovemaking. Right? It, there are even parts that describe <laughs> the female sex. The female organs, very strong languages in there, right? Uh, uh, I think there was a part in the uh, Songs of Solomon where he said, uh, I compare you to uh, a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are comely with ornament, your necks with strings of jewels. We will make uh, you ornaments of gold studded with silver, right? It says, ah, you are so beautiful. Your eyes are like doves. He says, my beloved is to me a cluster of enna, uh, 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 blossoms in the vineyard of Engedi. He says, your lips distill nectar. Honey and milk are under your tongue. How would he know unless he went to kiss it? <laughs> How would you know there's honey under someone's tongue? The scent of your body is like the scent of Lebanon. You are like a garden that is locked. My sister, my bride, you are a fountain that is sealed. Your channels, what was it? What do you think those channels are? Your channels are like an orchard of pomegranates that I come into. What do you think he was talking about? He was describing the female genitalia. <laughs> that was a husband describing that, that with his wife, right? He said, blow upon my garden that its fragrance may be wafted abroad. Let my beloved come into me. I am his garden. Let him come and eat me and eat all the fruits within me. <laughs> this is actually in the Bible, right? He said, your thighs are like jewel. How did he see the thighs? Unless they were open for him to see and touch. He says, your body is like a, a work of a master hand. Your navel, your belly button is like a rounded bow. I didn't know people's belly buttons can be like a bow. He says, your belly, those of you that hate your stomach, Songs of Solomon says, your belly is like a heap of wheat <laughs> and it is circular like uh, the encirculation of lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns. They look like twin towers of a gazelle. Larry, post them so that the people will read it tonight. <laughs> Amen. Your neck is like a beautiful tower. Those of you that hate your neck because it's long. Your eyes are like a pool in Heshbon. Your nose, those of you that hate your nose, your nose is like a tower of Lebanon. What does a tower of Lebanon look like? Right? So he was, he was observing his, the spouse. He says, your breasts are like clusters in my hand. How will you know they are like clusters in your hand except you went and touched, it, touched them? Eh? How, will, how, how will you know? <laughs> those of you that are married how, how, how will you know right unless you went and, and touched them songs of Solomon chapters 4 is where this is uh, uh, I'm reading this, this for thank you sir songs of Solomon chapters 4 it says I knew Larry will post that one he likes that scripture songs of Solomon 7.3 your two breasts are like two fawns Larry what is a fawn they are like twins of a gazelle hey <laughs> Anyways, the married people don't, don't get better. You are laughing. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Someone says, 
Let me see here. Let me scroll back to the chat so I don't miss anything. Someone says, when in marriage, the erotic is without shame, but glory. Yes. Right. Someone said here, let me check. Now that's biblical, biblically wooing. Songs of Solomon is something else. Can Solomon be known? It's getting hot in here. Right. Solomon means business, right? He was describing, but you see, if, if someone went online and did those things, someone that wasn't married or someone that we know you are married, but you are describing someone's wife that way, do you see how, how weird that would be? Uh, Beza, you're married, right? If your spouse described another woman that way, God forbid, that would be out of line. So this was a, 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 a couple, right? So it's not, it's not, so you can do something that can be shameful, but in the right context, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It didn't say this person put the pictures of themselves on Instagram. It didn't say the couple were putting pictures of their breasts and describing. He says, my, my lover's breasts are like twins. He didn't say, uh, I want the whole world to come and look at my lover's breasts online. No. He said, it's for me. It's, it's proprietary information. It's for me to enjoy Right. Good evening, Kenzie. Right. It's it's it, it's it, there, there's a sanctity and a sacredness about it, even though it sounds vulgar. Mm -hmm. The context within which that thing is being described is exactly someone said uh, uh, that would be an abomination if someone did that. Right. What I'm describing uh, outside of the right context. Someone said they were private, but he let it out in the Bible for us to learn. I love that for us to learn, for us to learn, for us to learn. So. Some of you might feel awkward us talking about it, but it's not to arouse you. That's not the point tonight. It is to teach us because people make sex look like a taboo or erotic love, but there is a context for erotic love, which is in the context of marriage. So the first type of love, erotic love, intense sexual desire for someone, passionate and overwhelming. And it is said that the Greeks often thought that it will cause someone to lose control of themselves or their actions because it's so strong. And they also thought that erotic love is very passing because you get in the intensity of the emotion. And if you don't take care, you may lose yourself after all the feelings are gone. But I'll talk about other types of love so that you realize that even in a marriage relationship, it's not just about erotic love. Those of you that are married, help me in the chat. Right, Because if that were the case, excuse me to say this, you would need to be having sexual intercourse with your spouse. You won't go to work. You get up in the morning, you clock in, you have sex, sex because after that sexual encounter is gone, you, know, you, you can feel very, you know, you're done. Now what next? So there is other things that preserve or keep that marriage, which is not just erotic love. There is a purpose for erotic love. To have children, procreation, to enjoy, right? Scientists, those of you that are in science, they say sex releases all these hormones and stuff that just gives you a good feeling, right? So God wants us to have a good feeling in the right context. When you do it outside in the wrong context, you can feel very robbed. You can feel a part of you that's stolen. You can feel very cheated. You can feel very, you, you can sometimes even hate yourself afterwards. You're like, I can't believe I gave myself to this person. But that's why Jesus came. That is why we're doing these teachings. That is why we're renewing our minds, right? So that we will, we will be in the right place at the right time, honoring God with our bodies. Someone give me an amen. The second type of love is philia, right? Uh, uh, the root word comes from the word um, brotherly. So um, um, the first city I actually came to when I came to the United States was Philadelphia. That was like, um, I think in 2000 and about maybe 20 years ago, the first time I came to the United States, I landed in uh, the, the state of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. I just came to a, a writing program. They had a writing workshop to teach uh, young people how to write. So I went for a, 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 a writing workshop, you know, to, to learn how to write different types of materials, books and whatnot. This was a long time ago, almost like 20 years ago. I landed in Philadelphia. And I remember when I got there, they had written in the airport, the city of brotherly love. And I, I asked my uncle, I said, what is that? He said, oh, it comes from the word philia, which means uh, uh, brotherly love. 
I said, oh, wow. And I said, so there's brotherly love here. He said, well, at the time, I don't know about Philadelphia today. He told me, man, Philadelphia is, is one of the very interesting places to actually live. So he told me, you got to be safe uh, when you go for that workshop. When your classes are over, go to the dormitory. Don't go anywhere. You know, when you're done, call me and your aunt. We want to know what you learned at the workshop. We're going to call your parents and let them know, you know. So I said, so why is it called City of Brotherly Love if people are killing each other? And he said, you know, it's, it's a lot of things, you know. So I never forgot what my uncle told me, right? Philia, uh, which is brotherly love. And, you know, every type of love is affectionate in some way, in some way. It may not be a sexual affection, but there's some sort of affection, right? Uh, you know, and Philia is, is, is described also in the Bible. When you look at Jesus and his disciples, right? Remember, Jesus called his disciples brothers. He called them friends, right? Uh, remember, he told uh, Peter in John 21, verse 17, he says, Peter, do you love me? At that time, he wasn't asking him if he loved him as a master. He said, if you love me like a best friend, right? It was a third question that Jesus had asked. If you look at John 21, 17, those of you that remember the New Testament series, we talked about this, right? Uh, 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 Larry put in the chat, right? This was his first appearance uh, following his resurrection, right? Uh, first John 3 verse 16, the Bible says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And in the same way, we have to lay down our lives for the brothers. Another version says for the brethren. So there is a love you can have for the brethren in the church, in the, you, you know, you know, uh, you know, in Ghana, sometimes, you know, when you go to the airport, you get that they'll say, you know, especially when they know you're coming from the United States or something, you know, they'll say, you know, Larry, uh, uh, don't you have something for the brothers, right? You know, they'll be asking for money or something, right? I I'm not your brother. I don't, I don't know you from anywhere, right? But then what they're saying is, I know we're not biological brothers, but you know we're brothers. You know, you know we're, you know, who has experienced that before? At some of the, I know at the Ghanaian, the, the, the Ghana airport, when you get there and the people help you to offload your luggage, it's almost like looking for a tip in a way, you know. But the, the lingo they use is, oh, you know, you know we're your brothers, eh? You know, you went to America, you left us, you know, we are, we are all in the community, we're all together. Let's give me something, you know, you know, show me some love, right? I don't know if they do that in Nigeria, but, you know, it's a thing. And they, they, the word they use is, don't you have something for your brothers? Don't you have something for your sisters, right? And you see the other people that are foreigners like, you ain't my sister. I don't know you from nowhere. <laughs> I worked to make this money. I bought a ticket. You're being paid. So what do you mean by something for the brothers? I don't have nothing for no brothers, <laughs> right? But exactly, Larry says, they use the word to, feel, to, to make you feel something towards them that we have the same community, right? You know, when something happens in a community, you know, that some people get up. There, there, there's, there's advocacy groups that get up, right? It's unfortunate we don't do that for the church. Recently, they were bashing this pastor in Ghana, and very few people stood up, right? Very few people stood up to defend his cause as, as brethren, as people in the body, right? So it doesn't mean that I'm going to have sexual intercourse with my pastor because I love him, <laughs> right? But there is a kind of love that lets you support people too. There's a brotherly love where you look out for people. Does that make sense? Right? So that's filial love. And you can have filial even in marriage. Some people don't look out for each other. Right? Some people don't look out for each other. Some people, sometimes there are certain things we do. Maybe Pasobi will do something. I'm like, man, that, that wasn't too good to, to do online. Sometimes I'll do something and he's like, man, next time don't do that. Larry, we need to work on that video or something. You know, what is he doing? He's looking out for me. Because I might think I'm doing the best job, I'm happy, I'm excited, but sometimes I'll be listening in the kitchen, cooking with the child on my back. I'm looking out for him because he's putting himself out there. The internet is a very dangerous place to be. Let's just be honest. It don't matter which way you think about it. You say you're going to put yourself out there. You got to be ready for what it comes with. So we look out for each other, right? You look out for uh, your brothers, right? Uh, 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 sometimes it feels like it's only in the church where when people are wounded, we just shoot them and finish them off, right? But even, uh, uh, I don't know if Ibrahim is online. Ibrahim, was it you or somebody that was telling me that in the military or, or in the police force, if someone is down, you, 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 
you you look out for them, something along those lines, right? Or, or I don't know if I watched it from Heist uh, on Netflix. There was a Heist show I was watching, and I think the professor had told them that when they go for the robbery, if one person goes down, this is what they have to do. They have to look out for each other. And I was amazed because that's the world. Leave no man behind, right? Is, is that what it's called in the military? Kenzie, is that what it's called? Leave no man behind, right? You have to look out. No man is left behind. Okay, so is that how they say it? No man is left behind. You look out for each other, right? You look out for each other. You look out for each other, right? You don't, you don't say, uh, um, you know, I remember sometimes, um, you know, when we got married at first, Pastor, we had one car at the time we were sharing. Our other car was not functional. So he would use the car and the gas is almost done and he brings it and I'm like, why is the tank empty? And he's like, you know, by the time I was trying to buy the grocery and do this and do that, and I knew you had to go to work. So, hey, when you are going to work, you know, you have a little more time, you plan the day, hey, put in some gas, right? It doesn't mean I'm also going to buy gas, use the car, make sure the car runs empty and then pack in the garage just so I can prove a point to him that, you know what, because you left the gas, the tank empty, I'm also going to leave the tank empty. No, <laughs> right? That's, 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 not a, that's not a healthy way um, to demonstrate your love, especially in a marriage relationship, right? So there's filial love, right? It, it's also a type of affectionate love, right? Uh, uh, um, and so in a way, filia can be related to eros as well. Uh, over, over in a romantic relationship, over time you build filia, right? You, you, you. It, but if you're not in a marriage relationship, if you are, if you are uh, in a friendship, it's it's looking out for each other, amen. Uh, looking out for each other. It's a friendly love. It's a soul to soul bond, right? Love shared amongst friends, right? It's characterized by loyalty and trust. Right, Hebrews 13 1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Right, let brotherly love continue. First Corinthians 3, verse 3. Those of you that were on the New Testament series, remember we talked about this. Paul said, Why is there so much jealousy and quarreling among you guys in the church? This is worldly, this must not be among brothers in the church. He said, why is there so much jealousy? People are jealous of people. People get together so they can pull people down. He said, that's not the kind of love we should demonstrate in the church. Right? Psalm 41 verse 9. Remember uh, uh, David. One of these days we'll go through the Psalms. Right? David was crying to God in prayer and he said, the person that I called a brother has turned against me. He says, the person that I trusted as a brother is the one that wants to kill me. The person that I thought was a brother is the person that wants to kill me. And he was lamenting to God in prayer, right? Lamenting to God in prayer. The third type of love, the third type of love, uh, let me check my notes here, uh, is agape, agapeo, right? Agape is described as a selfless, universal love, right? It's, it's very altruistic in nature. It's unconditional and very selfless. And it's a very high form of love, right? In fact, in the Christian community, uh, it is purported that it is this kind of spiritual love that Jesus Christ had for us. When the Bible says, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's a very, very sacrificial love. It, it, you see, all these loves are very connected in so many ways. Right. But I believe it's dimensions of them, you know, dimensions of, of, of this kind of love. Right. Because sometimes people will only will only support you so much. Right. So but agape is the kind of love which says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. Remember, Jesus said, which of you, will, will, we said, you can, you can uh, Larry, help me with this scripture. He says, you can lay down your life for a brother. But who, who amongst you will lay down your life for a sinner? DOV, if you tell me you are going to give me, um, I don't know, $1,000 to, to do something for you, because of the incentive, I, I might be convinced to do something for you, right? But... 
the kind of love that Jesus showed us, I mean, to me, that's risky because, I mean, what if people don't accept you as their Lord and Savior? What if, what if they say they don't even know you? What if, what if Peter denies you later, right? What if, what if he says he don't know you from nowhere? You know, what if Judas betrays you, right? And that is the measure and the nature and the stature that Ephesians says God wants us to mature to. It's not easy. And you cannot do this. You can't demonstrate this love in the flesh. You cannot demonstrate this love in the world as a, as a worldly person with a worldly perspective. You cannot. Granted, God did tell the disciples that you're going into the world, be harmless like a dove, but be as wise as a serpent. And so agape is not foolish love. When we say agape, it doesn't mean that I'm coming to you, come step on me, come treat me anyhow. No. There were times Jesus needed, so agape, yes, I love you, but if Jesus had not played his cards well, the people would have killed him before his time. If he had not listened to his father who gave, so agape is, is not love that you are trying to work out yourself. It's not you going out telling someone, let me, a lot of people have a savior complex. In a relationship, they feel like they have to go out and they have to be a savior for you. Uh, don't worry, I'll change him. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll do everything. I'll be his Lord. I'll be his master. And then later on, they found out, oh, shoot. I can't be this person's savior. He's not even listening to me. I don't have the kind of influence I was hoping to have. I mean, I'm a very spiritual woman. I'm a very spiritual man. Why can't I control this person? Some people even uh, 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 confuse agape with self, with uh, uh, control and manipulation. They think they can go into a relationship and manipulates the person with spiritual lines and, and uh, uh, aggressive spirituality. That's not agape. That's not agape. John 15, 13 says, no man has greater love. Agape is greater love. <laughs> or a stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. No man. You cannot demonstrate that in the flesh. You cannot demonstrate that in the flesh. The flesh doesn't teach us that. Right? The flesh does not teach us that kind of love. If you are with me, give me an amen. Right? The flesh does not teach us that kind of love. Right? It doesn't teach us that kind of love. This is the kind of love Jesus refers to throughout his ministry. And that is what the Christian faith encompasses. Right? That's what the Christian faith encompasses. And Jesus perfectly exemplified love. That is why we cannot talk about marriage without talking about Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Bible says that the man should love his wife as what? Someone help me in the chat. How should a man love his wife? If you are married, how should your husband love you? Because you have to understand, although I know this might be offensive, that you did not create marriage. You are not the author of that institution. Your community did not author marriage. God created the man and the woman and instituted marriage and gave them instructions as to how to enjoy that marriage. He said the man will leave and become one with his wife. The two will become one. And he told the man, this is how I want you to treat the woman. I want you to love her. I believe that love encompasses all the seven kinds of love. Love her erotically. Love her like a brother, like a sister. Uh, not like those of you that are, 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 are putting into brother zone, the sisters and the brothers, right? But love her like someone you look out for. Love her unconditionally. Love her all the other kind of loves I'm going to talk about. And then he said, you two women. Be a help meet for this man. Submit to him because he will be the epitome. He will be an earthly representative of Jesus. Yes. So marriage is the highest expression of the love that Jesus Christ has for the church. The Bible says Jesus loves the church and washes, washes the church with the water, with the word. The church is messed up. We are messed up. But Jesus washes us. So the kind of love, Beza, that Christ is talking about 
when it comes to marriage. It's not this kind of thing where we meet online, we get very passionate sexually, we have a sexual intercourse, tomorrow we hate each other, we block each other on the phone. That is why mar some, some marriage relations, of course, they are different dynamics, and even all the dynamics, whichever way you want to think about it, whether it's abuse or whatever, you can always see that there's a deficit of agape. There's a deficit of an understanding of healthy love because you cannot try and do the marriage thing your own way by controlling your husband by beating him by forcing him by by pretending like he's a dog no you see we think uh we've been trained to think that to make someone love you you have to force them if you have to force someone to love you 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 really have to investigate if you are love deficient because even salvation, which is very important, is not force. We have, you can make a decision to reject Jesus. It's not a good decision, but God gives you that free will. So you, how can you force somebody to love you? How can you say, no, you have to love me. You have to take me to the altar. You have to, you cannot do that. You cannot, you cannot control people. You can't have a problem with your husband. Come and see your pastor and then tell your pastor, pastor, please, can you go and tell this woman to, to, to by force? To, no. And if you have a pastor that's doing that for you, it's different if they are counseling you or teaching you. You cannot force love. You cannot tell me I have to love you. No. Who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? Love is given. The Bible says God loves the world so much that he gave. It didn't say God loved the world so much that he forced all of us to come and listen to a sermon. No. If you have to do that to feel loved, you, you probably have never really experienced the love of the father. As much as the, pro, as, as the prodigal son's father wanted him to come home, he didn't go and force him. But when he did come, he, and he ran and embraced him. But that man was longing for his son to come back home. Someone says, can you imagine how that even works? How, how are you going to force your, especially when, you, you see, more people that do that, eh? most of the time they actually are so love deficient. The only way they know love is force. Anytime you see force, tyranny, manipulation, control, that's a religious spirit. That's the, that's the spirit of the world. The world forces us. You, it's like a slave master kind of love. Whenever you want to see healthy love in a home, it's natural. Am I being real? It's natural. It flows. It's authentic. It's genuine. It's not forced. You can't even force somebody to come and be part of a ministry by force. No. If they love whatever it is, that's why Jesus asked the guy, do you love me? He didn't say, bro, I died for you. Bro. I'm going back to my father. You, 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 you have to do this. You, you are going to have to save souls. Like I'm going to force you. I'm going to put a whip on your back. You go, Paul, you're going to have to do this. No, he asked them, Beza, you love me? He said, yes. He said, you sure? He said, yes. He's okay. This is how you're going to demonstrate that you love me. You're going to have to demonstrate that by embodying what I have taught you. But you still have the choice. But if you love me, because you can love someone else, you can love something else. But if you love me, then this is what you will show to demonstrate. But at the end of the day, it is your decision to demonstrate that, to show that. I will not force you, but I've taught you love. I've come to this earth. I have lived a sacrificial life. You've seen me give food to the poor. You've seen me heal the sick. So I have demonstrated that love, but under no circumstance am I forcing you. If you truly love me, it will show. You cannot force somebody to give an offering. You can't force someone. No. If you truly love what we are doing, we will see your love. We will see your support. We will see your involvement. Does that make sense? Right? We will see it. So even Jesus gave Peter an opportunity to respond if he loves him. And you don't want to give someone an opportunity to say, I love you by force. You have to marry me. You have to take me to the altar. Who do you think you are? Even Jesus in John 21 verse 15 says, bro, you love me or what? He gave them an opportunity because maybe they don't love him. 
Love that is forced is questionable. Sincerely, it's questionable. You can give someone reasons to love you, but to force the person against their will, that is why rape is so, it, 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 so distasteful. It, it's horrible. It's unacceptable. You, you can't do that. You cannot. The fourth kind of love. So we've talked about erotic love, eros. We've talked about philia, affectionate brotherly love. We've talked about agape. The fourth one is storge. I think they say it's storgy or something. That is family love, right? This has to do more with the love a family feels for each other. You know, when I saw it, I was like, God, some of these are families, man. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody, everybody, Valentine's Day is talking about erotic love, which I, I want to think may be really what Valentine's Day celebrates. And that's why it can really be very, a very limited way of thinking because there's different kinds of love, right? Because on Valentine's Day, the father that is widowed with that child from that marriage, are you trying to tell me that there is no love between that father and that child? Are you trying to tell me that because the father lost his wife, he, he cannot, he has to wait until he marries to, to now experience love? No, there is love between a, a, a mother a, a, and a daughter. And there is hatred sometimes too. Can I be honest? People help me in the chat so I know I'm not saying something weird. There are people that hate their parents, either because their parents abuse them. I know someone whose father raped her. It, it, it's so traumatic. The Bible talks about parents loving their children, caring for them. Today I was doing something that it, it took almost the whole day. I was so tired. I've literally been running a 24 hour. Uh, 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 that's why you guys don't even see me online. I have so many things I'm doing in the background. And by the time I was so tired and I said, God, I want to take a nap. And then my husband says, the kids are coming home. I thought, no, they're going to have to eat. I can't leave them. They can't be hungry. As tired as I was. I don't know how I got the energy to get up and go and cook because I knew they would come home and they would be hungry. And I, I can't leave them hungry. Mothers, I, 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 am I being honest here? Right? Or, or you don't even have to be a mother. Some of you are guardians. You are in charge of taking care of people, right? You've been entrusted to take care of somebody. There's a kind of love because you see that person as family. You see that person as your own. Right? Someone said in the chat, the world has selected a specific session of the erotic love to delude the whole world of real love, even within marriages. Exactly. And that's why we're doing these teachings because I was talking to somebody that told me, I can't wait for Valentine's Day to pass. And I said, why? She said, because I don't have a boyfriend. And these people make it look like uh, those of us that don't have a boyfriend, we don't have any kind of love to celebrate. I said, you see, that's the deception because we've not been taught about different kinds of love. Kenzie, you might have a child. I'm sure you love your child. Even when your child does wrong, I'm very sure you still find a place in your heart to forgive them and still love them. I'm very sure. I'm very, very sure. You find a place in your heart to love them. It's a kind of family bond, right? It's also a very strong bond, right? And I even want to think that erotic love can evolve into storage. You know, sometimes, I don't know if you guys ever heard this, they used to say something like, when people get married, after a while, it's like they look alike or something. I don't know, have you guys heard that? I found it so weird. They say that people start looking alike. It's like they almost become a family. And rightly so, they really are a family, right? They, they, they become so alike in so many ways, right? And there's a kind of love among them that it, it's different. Right. I'll always hear my husband say, oh, we don't have money for this. We don't have money for this. But he will go into Target and go and buy new shoes for Angel, knowing very well Angel already has shoes. So you said you didn't have money for this. How come you have money to buy shoes for Angel? I thought you told me we didn't have money to go and buy a fridge. <laughs> you said we should still use the old fridge. But you, you went, you walked into a store as a man, walked in there, went into the girl's section and bought her shoes. Right. 
Some of you will, 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 will go heaven and earth for your children. And, and it, can, it can also be extravagant in so many ways. Some people even love their children even more than their husbands, right? It's like the, the familiar love is divided. It's like their children get 95% of it and then their husbands only get 5%, right? That's also something to address because the marriage covenant is a strong covenant. It's the only covenant that is compared to Christ's love for the church. Erotic love is not compared to Christ's love for the church. It's a kind of love, but it doesn't measure up to the kind of love that Jesus Christ had for the church. Right? Uh, 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 remember when God said, uh, when Jesus was being baptized, Matthew 3, 15, this is my beloved son mm -hmm. in whom I am pleased. Another version says, whom I love. Right. Remember how many of you remember from the New Testament series, Matthew 8, verse 5, we talked about the centurion that Jesus Christ asked uh, 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 the centurion that asked Jesus to heal his servant. He said, this this man is a good man. They weren't even related by blood, but that servant had become part of the family. There are people we work with. They've almost become like family in the ministry. Right. They, they become like family. Right. Storge is like a very strong familiar love. Remember Jarius, the synagogue leader who begged Jesus to heal his daughter. He said, please, Jesus, come and heal my daughter. The man, it was a man. Typically, we think men are very emotionless. It wasn't the mother that went to Jesus. It was the man that begged Jesus to come and heal his daughter. Right? So... For those of you that have kids, you know what I'm talking about. And even when you don't have kids, it's represented in different ways. That's why I gave you Mark chapter 5, Matthew chapter 15, so that you don't feel like if you don't have kids, you don't have storage. That's not true. Because there are people in the Bible who demonstrated love that is familiar love, who didn't necessarily have a bloodline relationship, right? Even though familiar love can be strongly expressed through bloodline relationships too right? Some of you have mothers that took care of you, maybe in school, in an orphanage or somewhere. The, the, the people have become like your mothers. You're like your real mothers, right? Because of a very strong familiar instinct, right? So number four, storgy. Number five, number five is pragma. Pragma. I found this interesting. Someone type pragma. It's the root word for the word pragmatic. Up. It, it, it refers to enduring love, love that stands the test of time, love that can withstand, right? It's, it's like a practical love that stands the test of time, right? You know, when you've seen couples that say, they, uh, uh, Pastor Miller, how many of you remember him? He came uh, to speak to us during the uh, end of the spiritual foundations fast. He's the man of God that we served under the redeemed Christian church of God in Midland for about six years. He sent us an invitation. Uh, he's celebrating 20 years of marriage. And when I looked at the flyer, I said, God, what does it look like to be married for 20 years? You know, they've, they've probably seen it all. Someone said, we've seen it all, seen it all. They've heard it all. I, 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 they've, 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 They've seen the worst of each other. They've seen the best of each other. In fact, I remember when we got married, we would argue and then we would call him. And then, you know, I'll tell him, Pastor, I'm very upset with my husband. And then my husband too will call his wife. I'm very upset with my wife. And they will just call us to their office and say, oh, don't worry. Everything is going to be fine. I'm looking at the man like, is this, is this man not aware of the level that we are fighting? Well, what does he mean is going to be well? Did, did he not see the anger with which I called to complain? Did, did he not see the, the way I was so upset when I called him? Well, what does he mean is going to be well? Is he trivializing the problem or what, right? They've seen it all. They've seen it all. And he told me, oh, this problem, oh, don't worry. I said, Pastor, I'm going to be worried. What do you mean I shouldn't get worried? I am going to be worried. And then he would laugh. And then he would ask me, do you want a drink? I said, no, I don't want a drink. I'm upset. I want to fight with Pastor Obi. Help me fight. And then you're asking me if I want water. What do I want water for? I just came to your house to complain. You're asking me if I want a drink, if I want a puff loaf, if I want cookies. I don't want cookies. I want to pick a fight. That's what I want to do. And then his wife will make rice. And then we'll eat it. And then we'll laugh. And I'm like, 
you know what? I think I have to find new people. I don't like these people. They don't take people's life seriously. They don't, they don't, they don't like fights. I don't like that. I want people that can fight. I want people that will join me. So I'll fight this man. I don't like the way they are so easy going. Today I look back and I'm like, oh my God, how, how stupid I was. I, I, in fact, he even calls us and he jokes. He said, do you remember? And I said, pastor, does it mean we won't fight anymore? And he says, well, you may still have disagreements, but you have matured to a certain level. He asked me, he said, the things you guys used to fight about, do you really fight about them? I said, pastor, we even laugh over them. I said, pastor, you remember that time I called you and I was so upset and I told my husband I'm moving out of the house, of the apartment, and I didn't even have any place to stay. Pastor, I won't do that again, oh. The way I want to enjoy this house, I'm not moving anywhere, oh. I'm not going anywhere, pastor, <laughs> right? You know, I would threaten him. I'm going to go out. Where are you going? <laughs> Your credit card is even maxed out. You couldn't even book. I couldn't even book a hotel room, even if I wanted to go out. Where are you going? <laughs> eh? One day, pastor asked me, where are you going? I said, pastor, I'm going out. He said, no, really, where are you going? Because you are definitely not coming to my house. We don't have a room for you here. So go back to your, your marital house. Go and solve this problem with your husband. He too, he will get upset and say, I'm going to stand on the porch and I'm just going to watch the stars and I'll be fine and I'm just going to be in prayer and you, you can have the room to yourself. <laughs> right? Where are you going? Where are you going? Really, where are you going? And this was not an abusive case or anything. This was just us having disagreements that we were too childish to address. Right? So I looked at the fly and I said, wow, God. I pray God will give as many people that are married and desiring to be married 20 years and more, all of us, of a good and a healthy marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. I looked at the fly and I said, wow, Pastor, this is, this is beautiful. I pray that we also will celebrate 20 years one day, 30 years one day, 40 years, not of pain and sorrow, but of healing, of healthy relationships in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So how many have we talked about? We've talked about like five, right? So we talked about, uh, 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 um, we talked about uh, erotic love. We talked about agape. We talked about um, philia. We talked about pragma, enduring love. We talked about uh, storgy, familial love, right? Um, uh, and to give you an example, even of um, uh, pragma, right? Uh, let me mute this person here. Sorry, someone is trying to reach me. Um, pragma is uh, also seen when the Bible uh, talks about, uh, remember Genesis chapters 21, verse 1 to 7. Remember um, uh, uh, Abraham and Sarah, right? Uh, they had been married for decades, believing God for a child. It, it takes a very enduring love to bear with somebody through the ups and downs. Someone type the ups and downs, right? It is a lot. You know, some people will say, you know, I only love you as long as you give me a child. If you can't give me a child, I don't love you. You know, but there's a kind of love that exists even before you have a child, right? Because when you were getting married, you didn't have a child. And even if you had a child when you were getting married, I want you to understand the context I'm, I'm describing this thing. Because the marriage even though you went into the marriage with a child, the marriage was not between you, the child, and your husband. The marriage was between you and your spouse. That is why the Bible says, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. He says, the man will leave and become one with his wife. So even if, yes, you went in the marriage with a child, we know you love your child, but the marriage is still between the man and the woman. And again, that covenant is a strong covenant. So when people try to use children as a weapon in marriage to weaponize their spouses, well, I'm going to use the child to do this, to prove this to you, to do that. You really have to investigate or people try to use their possessions or something to, to weaponize against another spouse. It's very important, right? Genesis 2 verse 24 says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two, it didn't say you, your mom, your mom's mom, your mom's sister, your boss. No. Y'all ain't part of that marriage. It's the man 
and the wife. Best friend, you ain't part of that marriage. You are not. You are still a friend. You are still a confidant. But automatically, that marriage covenant trumps any other friendship that was, you know, some people say, this one was my friend before I got married. He's the person I was sharing all my secrets with. Your new secret sharer is the spouse. Am I saying don't talk to your friends? Please don't do that. You should talk to them because you're going to need them. So don't cut them off just because you're married. But the marriage covenant is compared to the church, compared to Christ's love for the church. God demonstrates marriage is like the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's a strong covenant. It's the covenant that procreates. It's the covenant that models the love that God had for humanity by sending his son. It's a very strong covenant. No wonder the devil is so interested in marriage, trying to get into marriage, get into even the fruit of marriage, children, trying to confuse children, family, and mess the whole thing because marriage is so strong. It threatens the end because he knows that institution is a perfect picture of the Trinity. It's a perfect picture of God himself, the Godhead. And it upsets him because it's such a beautiful institution and a strong structure. So the enemy will destroy nations, communities by first destroying family. Because once the family structure is broken, there will be all kinds of things you can think about. All kinds of things you can think about. All kinds of things you can think about. Uh, there's a comment, uh, someone says, pragmatic love, social dist. Please explain more to me. I'll, I'll be interested in lear learning that perspective as well, right? Uh, because of time, let me move on real quick to the other two. Uh, Pastor Obi only gave me one session, and he said, make the most of that one session, right? Uh, Larry, which one are we on, number six um, or seven? Let me know. But if it's six or seven, philosia is the sixth love. That is self-love or self-compassion. I don't know about some of you. Maybe someone can tell me this in the chat. I met a lady that told me she hates herself and she always tries to bring herself down. I was very shocked. I thought it was a joke. So when she said it, I laughed. I actually laughed and she got upset. And I said, oh, I thought that was a joke. And she said, no, I'm not joking. She said she actually lives a life where she hates herself. And she always... Um, like, let's say if there's something she can do to help herself, she does the very opposite to bring herself down. And I thought it was a joke because I never thought there was such a thing. As a matter of fact, we tend to think of people as being selfish. Normally people want, you know, if we go to a buffet, you want to be the first person to eat. You want to be the first person to get the food. You want to be the first person to have this. She said hers is not sacrifice for people. Hers is intentional self-infliction of pain on herself. And she said that's what her mind tells her to do to herself. Her body tells her to put harm on herself. I said, really? She said, yeah. She said it, it's this thing that tells her to disrespect her body, hate herself, and always short, uh, shortchange herself. And I said, this may be a demon. Because... It, it, <laughs> The, the man in Mark chapter 5 that was cutting himself, he was demon-possessed. People don't typically think of hurting themselves. You have to take care of yourself. Right? We've been taught this kind of love where, you know, you have to let go of yourself, eat anyhow, behave anyhow. Jesus told the disciples, I'm sending you out to the world. You all better don't be foolish, boys. Don't be foolish because I didn't come to this world and was foolish. When people try to push Jesus out, he obeyed the father. So the love, you see, we've been taught that love means give me your body, compromise, sell yourself short, right? You have to think of Felicia as self-compassion, eating healthy food, getting enough sleep, getting exercise. If I am sick and I take myself to the hospital, is that pride? That's me taking care of myself. You should take care of yourself. Right? You should take care of yourself. It's very, very important. 
sometimes when people want to donate a kidney to another person, those of you that are in medicine, maybe you can help me. Someone was telling me that sometimes they check to make sure that you yourself, you have a functioning kidney so that by taking your kidney, we don't also, because please don't forget Jesus died, but he rose again. No. If you don't take it, you will kill yourself and you may not rise. So you have to understand. <laughs> and Jesus, his father sent him to do that and gave him a promise and assured him that was God in the earth realm. You, you have to be careful. Though. <laughs> Otherwise, you, you would die and we, we would throw a nice funeral and people come and eat and go home. You have to take care of yourself. Your self-esteem is important. There are people that constantly want to put people down. Constantly. No, lately I'm so intentional about my mental health. I I'm so intentional about the things. I'm intentional about my family. I'm very intentional because it's taken us a lot to build what we've built. This is someone that will leave the home and go and tell pastor, I'm leaving, I'm going to someone's house. And if I have been able to build myself to this place, why would I bring myself down? Why would I disrespect my home? Why would I let someone come in and come and disrespect our home, disrespect what, what God has put in our hands to give him glory? Why, why would you do that? The Bible says the wise woman looks for a way to strengthen her home, but the foolish girl goes around destroying her own house. Even if my husband is wrong, there's a way I must look out for him. I must not go and stand in someone's house and tell them, Pastor, my husband is a very foolish man. He doesn't know... He doesn't know who I am. He, he's me listening to you. I will just be watching you and thinking this girl needs help. This girl really needs help because you, you and that person are one. You are thinking of just erotic love. You had one sexual affair and you're okay. But in God's eyes, you are one in holy matrimony. So when you, when you are jabbing yourself, you are also jabbing the other person. You see, most of the time, people that abuse people, eh, you find out they don't love themselves. You find out they themselves hate themselves. Look at the kind of help the pastor gave me. Why will I, why will I take a gun and blow this man's head? Even if he offended me, because people do offend you sometimes. You get upset. We argue all the time. In fact, the other day, we even argue. I even forgot what we're arguing about. We finished, and then we started laughing. And then we said, hey, you, you, are the, you, are, you are the one that initiated the argument. Then he, too, he pointed his hand. You are the one. I said, you know what? It's okay. Whoever is the one, the argument is over. Can we move on and just move on? Why would I do that? You must hate yourself to take a gun and blow it in someone's head. You must hate yourself to take a knife and jab it at someone. Most of the time, it has nothing to do with the other person. You yourself, you, you already have a love deficient problem. You already hate yourself. You are not sure about yourself. You're not confident about yourself. So your way of expressing your anger is to take it to other people's homes, take it to other people's ministries, try and pull down what they are doing because you are so love deficient. So anytime you see an expression of love, it, it, it irks you. The, the thing ugh, comes up in you and because you've never seen a picture of healthy love. But instead of looking at that thing and hating that person, you should ask, I'm not coming from a healthy place. How can I get better? So most of the time, when you start counseling somebody in, you shouldn't just get up and say, okay, Beza, buy your husband out so your husband will love you. You actually need to begin to talk to the two people. You will realize there's a, there's a love deficiency that has nothing to do with the other spouse. It has nothing to do with the other spouse. It's that person and that person. Most people's way of fixing their marriage, they think is, oh, pastor, go and talk to Beza so that Beza will, will do this for me. Go and force Beza to buy me flowers. Go and force Ami to buy me a, a, a jewelry. Go and force, no. Because they think that thing will, will, will feed the deficiency within them. You are going to have to open and find the root cause of that love deficiency and receive the agape of Jesus Christ. That will help you and heal you. So that when someone doesn't even do something, whether they don't give you flowers or whatever it is, because then every day your husband has to buy you flowers, that means he needs to go and learn agriculture because you need to plant flowers. He would... Man, <laughs> Pastor Obi is laughing. You have to go and do agriculture because every day he has to buy you flowers. <laughs> <laughs> He has to go and start flower, flower a flower farm. Eh? It's serious, though. It's serious stuff. 
<laughs> so yes, 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 it's not a flower farm. <laughs> yeah? And those of us that like money, Pastor, you know I like money. That means you have to get four jobs. Every day you have to give me 10 bucks. That's what I call get there. <laughs> right? I'm not saying that if someone gives you flowers, it's wrong. As a matter of fact, one of the things Pastor Obi is going to talk about is love language, right? But I hope you understand the core of what I'm saying. I'm not saying if, if your husband gives you flowers, you, you are a flower girl and you are a bad person. No, please. If you must get the flowers, let him show you love and give you the flowers, <laughs> please. But I want you to understand that. I want you to understand the framework of what we're talking about, if that makes sense. You understand? Uh, but because of time, I'll talk about the last one and then, and then we'll wrap up. Um, the last one is Ludus, which is a very playful type of love, right? You know, it's very, you know, it's like a quick heartbeat. It's like a, the butterflies you feel. It's a very soft, playful type of love, right? Very, um, yeah, very soft and very jokey. Some, sometimes you even tease people, right? How killing many of you? Softly. Killing me softly. <laughs> Pastor B says, killing me softly. Sometimes you tease people, you know, you, 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 you know, you play with them. You know, it, it's a very teasing, joyful type of love. Almost flirty sometimes even, right? Um, it can be very... Uh, uh, playful, especially in the earlier stages of dating, right? Uh, the focus is more kind of like fun rather than building a relationship. Just, you know, very playful, very, very playful, right? Very playful. Uh, I think Songs of Solomon 4 verse 3 also talks about some playful types of love, right? So even in, in, in Solomon's description of his wife's breast, which is in the Bible, by the way, right? There's also some playfulness, uh, 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 isn't there something called like foreplay, even in sexual intercourse, right? So very playful type stuff, right? And even outside of sexual intercourse, sometimes you just, you tease people, you pull their legs, you play with them, right? But you have to be careful. Some people don't like playing or they are very, very serious. If you don't take care, you play with them, they will jab you with a knife, <laughs> right? They don't love teasing. They don't love joking. They don't love any of that. Just go straight to the point, <laughs> right? So... Uh, our time is up, so I'm going to have to wrap up on these seven dimensions of love. Someone says rigid people, right? But I hope we learned something, right? But don't think of this love as compartmentalized love, right? Like, don't go home and say, okay, uh, my husband, you, after tonight, I've seen that you only show me two kinds of love. I see that you, 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 you are deficient in five areas. Come, let me beat you. No. We are not asking you to go and pick an argument and go and go and check off people and 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 tell people that you know we are, we don't want any fight in anyone's home tonight, right? But think about these things. Someone said the honeymoon phase. You see, that's why when these phases pass away, right? Ask yourself. Eh? For those of us that are married, me, I'll confess this confession and I'll wrap up. I know when I wasn't married on Valentine's Day, I would just be in my college room and I'm like, hey God, the way I, when I marry one day. Hey, I will make sure that I, 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 my husband will touch every part of my body, my nose, my ears, my, my everything, everything. The other day I told him, please, let me breathe, oh, let me breathe. I'm trying to take care of these three children. I'm trying to get a second job. Let me breathe. Let me breathe in this life. Don't come and trouble me at all. Don't, don't, don't come and trouble me in the flesh. <laughs> don't come and trouble me in the flesh. For I, I, I bear many marks. <laughs> let, me, let me think. I bear many stretch marks on my belly. Let me think. Let me think of my life. You understand? But if, if we are not having sexual intercourse every day, what, what do you think is keeping the home? You, you understand? What do you think? What, what, what kind of love do you think? You see, so we, we, you, you look at Jesus Christ. He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Those of us that study the New Testament series, the Bible said that, uh, Christ is not patient in a way that makes people think he's weak. He's patient because he loves us. Jesus Christ died for us. There are people that have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but God is still hopeful and believing that many will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So what do you think it is that sustains these things? So please, as the commercialization of Valentine's Day is going about, if you desire to marry I think it's a good desire. God wants us 
to be in a good marriage if you desire to be married. I said if because I don't want people that, hey, if you don't desire to marry, I used to think everybody had to marry, but I've come to terms with the fact that some people, Pastor, is that okay to say? Yeah, some people don't want to marry, and I, I, I don't see why we, we make them look like they are demons. I think it's, it's, it's even fair to be more truthful than to try and go and do something because mm -hmm. you are, Kenzie said, my bro, you are in trouble, <laughs> right? So for those that desire to be married, I think that's a good desire. Mm -hmm. But after explaining these seven types of love, right? Erotic love, agape love, filial love, storgy love, ludus love, Felicia love, right? Uh, uh, yes, love. And, the, and the pragma, thank you, sir, right? Begin to think about Valentine's Day beyond, beyond these things because there are some people that will get flowers and be dumped in the month of March. It will not be you in Jesus' name. Amen. There are people that will go and follow people's husbands and get erotic, passionate love on that night. And nine months later, they'll be in court fighting over custody yeah. with that child. And I'm not here to judge any... My point is not to laugh at someone that has a child. No, that's not my point. I want you to understand that the world can sometimes belittle love so much and make it look like one aspect of love. Definitely, will you feel some type of way? Yes, because... And that is why I started off by talking about sex and the breast and those things because if we are honest with ourselves, we'll realize that Valentine's Day really is more towards the erotic love and all those things it, it arouses. And so people are thinking about just that aspect. So that is why if you want that and you want to marry, don't bend. Paul said, if you feel like you can't handle the passion, go and marry. Larry, go and marry your wife, your yeah, fiancé. Larry, Larry said he was burning today. Oh my God. Larry, He's you need burning. to call us. <laughs> said he Apparently Larry said he's burning and he desires to marry. Please, I want everyone to start praying for him. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that as many that desire to marry, you will put them in beautiful homes in the name of Jesus. As many that also might be married and are thinking of this Valentine's Day and like, oh my goodness, I hate this day because I'm not enjoying my marriage. Father, we pray for your peace in every home in the name of Jesus. Whatever causes people to just even hate their lives, hate their marriage because of a deficit. I pray, God, that you reveal to us your love, which is the ultimate love. Through your love, we see other kinds of love. We, sh we saw you showing brotherly love to the disciples. We, sh we saw you showing uh, love to your mother when you went to the wedding in Cana. We, we saw you showing uh, uh, different kinds of love. We saw you showing expressions of love uh, uh, through uh, the God-inspired words of the songs of Solomon. We saw these, even, it, it was even essentially through a marriage relationship that you, Jesus Christ, was born. Although, because you were God, you were born without sin and you came uh, uh, through the incorruptible seed of the Holy Spirit, but you have created institutions on this earth for our enjoyment because you want us to enjoy this earth. You want us to enjoy the things you've created. You created them for us. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that our relationships will glorify you. As many that desire a good relationship, Lord, I pray that you will lead them in those right paths. As many that are in toxic relationship, I pray you give them the boldness to come out of those places. As many that are desiring, Lord, for whatever it is when it comes to the area of love and relationship. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would open this door for them. You will bring them the, uh, a good spouse. You will help them work through things. For those of us that are already married, Lord, we know that life is in stages. I pray in the name of Jesus wow. that you will give us wisdom for the next stage of life. We cannot think we are complacent in any way. So I ask for wisdom to continue to grow from glory to glory in the name of Jesus. I pray you will bless our relationships. I pray you will bless our families. I pray that you will bless our children. You will bless each and every one and strengthen our homes in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Piakubi. Thank you, Mr. Kenzie, Sister Stephanie, Brother Larry. God bless you. We appreciate you. We love you so much, sir. Thank you, Sister Bezawak. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Ami. Just scrolling back to the chat. I know some of you may have had to leave. Uh, Dr. Dio, uh, Minister Dov, God bless you all. Uh, Brother Danny, thank you, sir. God bless you all so much. Our time is fast spent, so I'll leave you. Uh, make sure you like this video, you share it with someone, you subscribe to our channel, the Impact Citadel channel, so that you can stay updated with what we are doing. God bless you so much. Uh, we will see you again, God willing, tomorrow. This week we're talking about love. I've talked about the seven dimensions of love. We'll talk about dating. How do you date? What is dating? We'll talk about marriage. And then we'll also talk about sex in the capacity to help us. Or oh, Peter Gaye, God bless you. She said, a mother's job never ends. God bless you so much. And so have a wonderful evening, everyone. God bless you. And we love you. We'll see you, God willing, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central Time. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Today I've heard your message. And I know you are the only way for the truth. No one goes to the farm except to you. Ready to pick up my cross and follow you. Lord, forgive me of all, all my sins. I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. From today, write my name in the Lamb Book of Life. In Jesus' name, Amen.